So I'm Jerry Downs, and uh, I'll be giving the first half of our presentation about models of brain dysfunction and disease. Uh, Becky Reedy will be giving the second half of our presentation, and if you look in your schedule there, you'll see that Mariana Pereira is also listed. Um, she will not be presenting, but she was integral to helping us put this together. So what do we mean by brain dysfunction and disease? So we define this phrase pretty broadly. Uh, we mean any neurological disorder, such as Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease, or any neuropsychiatric symptoms, which manifest as abnormalities of thought, feeling, or complex behavior, such as anxiety, stress, or depression. And just to underscore the enormous societal burden of these disorders combined, according to one source at least, as many or more Americans are hospitalized with neurological or neuropsychiatric disorders than any other major disease group, including heart disease and cancer. And so this covers a large swath of neuroscience. And reflecting that, um, this theme encompasses the previous themes, the more focused themes that you've heard about. And so faculty that belong to this theme also most of them belong to some of the more focused themes we've heard about earlier this morning. Uh, here at UMass Amherst, most of the neuroscience labs are basic science labs with strong translational implications. Uh, and although our medical school is located some distance away in Worcester, as you'll hear about in the next presentation, it's important to keep in mind that we have a strong concentration of faculty here uh, that focus on human clinical neuroscience and applied research, and this is what Becky will be speaking about in a moment. This includes an accredited clinical psychology program, and then there are other faculty in psychological and brain sciences and in communication disorders. So what are some of the characteristics of the brain dysfunction and disease community here at UMass Amherst? Well, first of all, it's fairly large. So there are about 30 core faculty labs, mostly in psychological and brain sciences and biology, but we also have members in kinesiology and communication disorders. Uh, and these core faculty either have existing collaborations or see natural opportunities for collaborations with faculty members in a host of other departments, such as chemistry, polymer sciences, physics, computer sciences, environmental health, biomedical engineering, vet and animal sciences, and biochemistry. Uh, as you've heard about in the earlier presentations this morning, we utilize many different model systems, including zebrafish, rodents such as mice, rats, and hamsters. We just heard about the marmoset, non-human primates, and humans. So we span the gamut of biological organization. We study uh, brain dysfunction at the level of single cells, how dysfunction affects cellular activity within circuits. We have uh, animal models of different neurological or neuropsychiatric disorders, and of course we study um, the effect of these disorders in human subjects. We also study a wide range of neurological and neuropsychiatric models, for example, a form of blindness, autism with epilepsy, Alzheimer's disease and stroke, and I'll speak a little bit more about these in a moment. And we have some overarching questions, such as what are the mechanisms of different diseases, and relatedly, what mechanisms hold promise for new therapies? So currently, our organizational structure is at the level of individual faculty or small groups of faculty asking these questions. And one aspect, one point we would appreciate input from our, uh, our expert panel is should we think about organizing our community along certain disease themes so that we could study a given disease or set of diseases along different uh, levels of biological organization, for example, addiction or neurodegeneration. And so to reflect the uh, current organization of our community, what we're going to do is just give you a few snapshots of different faculty projects and collaborations, starting first from animal models and then working through towards work in humans, and that's what Becky is going to talk about. So one strength of our community is that we have uh, three zebrafish neurobiology labs in the biology department. Uh, some time ago, 
the biology department decided to invest, getting attacked by a fly here, <laughs> uh, decided to invest in uh, the zebrafish model, and we currently have four faculty that use zebrafish as a model system. Three of us are neurobiologists, myself, Abby Jensen, and Rolf Karlstrom. A zebrafish is a fairly popular widespread model organism because they, the larvae in which many zebrafish researchers focus upon develop very quickly going from a single cell to a pretty well-formed embryo um, within a day. They're optically transparent, so readily amenable to imaging approaches. You don't have to dissect out the brain. You can just look right through the animal. And they're very amenable to genome editing approaches. You may have heard about the revolution in genome editing provided by CRISPR technology. And the zebrafish community has wholeheartedly embraced genome editing and continues to innovate. And as those innovations come online, we rapidly bring them into our labs. And so this is a strength for our community. So a question in my lab is can we develop a new model of autism with epilepsy? Autism with epilepsy is a neurometabolic disorder that is poorly understood at the cellular and network levels. Uh, it's due to the mutation, at least one form, of a single gene. Uh, and what we would like to do is we would like to mutate the gene, the zebrafish version of the gene that's already been identified in humans, and then perform a variety of different cellular analyses to look at neuronal morphology and neuronal connectivity. And so this is uh, just showing an example of a couple of neurons in a zebrafish brain. Again, we don't have to dissect them uh, in order to get these kinds of images. Uh, and then through collaboration, uh, perform a variety of different kinds of cellular analyses, such as electrophysiology, which is depicted here. Ultimately, we'd like to use behavior, quantitative behavioral analysis, as a readout. And so the goal of this project is to be able to better characterize autism with epilepsy at the cellular and network levels, leveraging the rapid development of zebrafish uh, and the accessibility of its nervous system. And by characterizing those properties, we hope to be able to gain new insights into possible therapies. In Abby Jensen's lab, they're asking what are the molecular and cellular mechanisms of a form of blindness. And so stepping outside of the brain for a moment into the retina, Abby Jensen uh, is interested in the morphology of the rod cell. And the degeneration of rod cells is a leading cause of blindness. These rod cells, which are schematized here, have this morphology, and Abby's interested in how this morphology is established and maintained. This morphology is a balance between uh, the shedding of this outer segment and its continual renewal, and when that balance uh, is out of whack, when there's an imbalance, it can lead to degeneration. What we're looking at over here uh, are the results of some of the wonderful genetic tools that Abby has generated in order to monitor and examine these outer segments. So we're looking at rod cells uh, from a zebrafish retina, and we can see that this stripe that is uh, genetically encoded uh, allows them to monitor the length and the integrity of this outer segment. Uh, importantly, because zebrafish are small and they're aquatic, you can put lots of different compounds on them. So Abby has been performing a small molecule screen in which she's been incubating and making use of her model of photoreceptor degeneration to look for compounds that either stimulate growth or inhibit shedding. And these compounds could be developed into new drugs to prolong vision. The flip side of the coin from degeneration is neural development. And in Rolf Karlstrom's lab, he's asking how do stem cells generate hypothalamic pituitary growth? What we're looking at here is uh, an image through zebrafish larva. And he's, genetic, he's developed genetic tools to be able to look at, to be able to visualize signals that regulate stem cells. And so everywhere we see that's dark green indicates uh, cells that have received this signal. The signal is called sonic hedgehog. And so we can see that in the hypothalamus and in the pituitary, he observes uh, a response to these signals. And so by studying these, these stem cells and, and being able to uh, examine 
um, their regulation, uh, this can provide insight into vertebrate development and aging. Uh, in Eric Bittman's lab, he's asking, what are the molecular and cellular mechanisms of jet lag? And this circles back around to what you heard Luke mention earlier. Uh, jet lag is a mismatch between the endogenous circadian rhythms and the environment. And that's controlled by a portion of the hypothalamus, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which has been labeled here with various markers. So the suprachiasmatic nucleus is the master clock that regulates all of the subservient clocks. And so that's illustrated here. The suprachiasmatic nucleus would be this clock, regulating these other clocks in the body. And as uh, Luke had mentioned, uh, the Bittman lab has identified a mutation that um, is able to, if we look down here, we have these activity plots. And we can see that these gray regions are the, the day-night cycles. These dark dashes indicate activity. And where we see a mismatch between the light-dark cycle and the activity, this represents jet lag. So in Eric's lab, they have identified a mutation that doesn't experience jet lag. You can see that they're able to sync with the environment almost immediately. And so currently, they are performing whole genome sequencing to identify this gene. And then because uh, this regulation of circadian rhythms impacts many different disease processes, such as heart disease uh, and cancer and immune resistance, they plan to look at the effect of this mutation on those different kinds of disorders, such as cancer. Mariana Pereira's lab is interested in the neurobiology, the brain circuits that underlie parenting. And so one of the questions they're asking is, what are the neural mechanisms by which postpartum depression affects parenting ability? And more specifically, they've been looking at the role of dopamine, which is being shown here, the ability to detect dopamine, and how dopamine plays a role in these circuits which are known to be implicated in postpartum depression. And so by being able to modulate dopamine levels, they're able to see at how that affects parenting abilities in a rodent system. Uh, currently, they're also looking at the role of other genetic components to modulate postpartum depression. And those could be developed into new therapies to treat that disorder. We also have a group of researchers that are interested in how alcohol and other drugs of abuse and addiction affect cognitive, pro cognitive processes. And so there's a recent publication from Heather Richardson's lab in which they were able to demonstrate that uh, adolescent exposure, uh, rat adolescent exposure to alcohol decreased the density of myelinated fibers. And that this decrease in myelinated fibers was able to uh, was correlated with deficits in behavioral performance as adults. In David Mormon's lab, they've been focusing on hypocretin orexin cells in uh, the hypothalamus. And these hypocretin uh, orexin cells are known to be involved in the motivation for lots of different kinds of processes, in particular for drug abuse uh, like alcohol. And what they observed, what we're looking at here, are, uh, is CFOS staining in which they've been able to observe a correlation between these, the activity of these hypocretin orexin cells and preference for alcohol. In Mariana Pereira's lab, uh, they're interested in decision making in the postpartum uh, period and how that can be affected by um, drug abuse. And so she's been examining different neural circuits to see how they might be regulated to, for example, here shown a, a, a rat trying to make a decision whether to care for its pups or to have a binge of cocaine. And so by examining um, these circuits and being able to better characterize them, uh, she hopes to be able to provide insight into treating uh, new mothers who are suffering from drug addiction. In Elena Vesey's lab, She's been asking, what is the impact of locus ceruleus neuronal loss in neurodegenerative disorders? Um, so she's been focusing specifically on the neuroadrenergic cells and 
in some of her work, she's been focusing on rodent models to look at how uh, loss of those cells affects downstream circuit function and subsequent behavior. It's also known that loss of these neuroadrenergic cells in the locus ceruleus happen early on in certain neurodegenerative disorders, such as Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. And so she's been working with post-mortem uh, human tissue to develop new biomarkers for locus ceruleus integrity, uh, and that's what's depicted here in both Alzheimer's disease and, and uh, Parkinson's disease. And so by studying the impact of locus ceruleus neuronal loss, looking at how it affects downstream circuit function and behavior, and in developing new biomarkers, she's hoping to help and develop new therapies to treat these neurodegenerative disorders. So at this point, we'll move over to the human clinical neurosciences side of things. Hi, I'm Becky Reedy. I'm from Psychological and Brain Sciences, and I'm the director of our clinical science um, psychology program. So I'm really pleased to be here and tell you a little bit about the work in human clinical neuroscience. Um, same questions that drive the human end of the clinical work are um, what Jerry just told you. For example, what are the mechanisms of different diseases? For example, what are mechanisms that underlie cognitive impairment in various neurodegenerative diseases such as Huntington's, Parkinson's, and Alzheimer's disease? Also, we're interested in studying what mechanisms hold promise for new therapies. I'll tell you a little bit about therapeutic interventions that improve uh, language, recovery, and stroke, for example, and how neuropsychiatric symptoms may interact in such a way that would be useful in um, planning um, treatment in, in um, neuropsychiatric disorders. So one example of um, some work that's being done in human clinical neuroscience, this was a collaboration several years ago, but it is, I will tell you, has, has grown over time. Um, Becky Spencer and my lab collaborated to determine early um, preclinical markers of preclinical Alzheimer's disease. We studied adult children of a parent with Alzheimer's disease, collected uh, genetic data determined who was ApoE4 positive, a strong risk factor, factor for Alzheimer's disease, as well as comprehensive neuropsychological data and brain image, structural brain imaging, and found that the, the midlife adults uh, positive for ApoE4 allele had evidence of slower processing speed that was linked with lesser white matter volume. So collaborations like this are continuing and expanding. This is a recent grant submission from Becky Spencer's lab that um, pulled in my expertise in neuropsychology as well, as well as Rosie Cowles in brain imaging and memory. And this is an exciting collaboration which aims to determine how a nap intervention may increase daily sleep time and cognition in patients with Alzheimer's disease. And the, um, the therapeutic impact is, is immediate and tremendous if um, simple interventions at home can be helpful for patients and caregivers. It would be really phenomenal. And you've heard a lot about Dr. Spencer's work this, today, but I just want to highlight here her, the significance of her work in studying human um, clinical problems. For example, sleep in Alzheimer's disease, as I've mentioned, traumatic brain injury, which I think is an area, area of potential growth on this campus. I think in terms of neuropsychology and neuroscience, we can really do a lot in terms of concussion research. And she's also collaborating in work, of course, studying ADHD. Jackie Curlin is asked, studies oh, one of many questions here. How does treatment-induced neuroplasticity improve language outcome in stroke survivors? An example of her work, she is studied in, in chronic moderate to severe aphasic. So these are persons who've suffered a stroke, have now passed their acute recovery stage a time at which many years ago they would have been told, well, that's it. Six, 12 months, what you've got, you've got in terms of your motor function, your language. And what she's showing in these persons is that intensive language intervention plus six months of at-home practice can result not only in behavioral improvement in language, but um, she can show evidence of neuroplasticity on neuroimaging. And even such that there's, there's individual signatures in terms of the, the neuroplasticity. She can show individual differences in how those patients are recovering, which is fantastic. And again, it has immediate translational impact. This gives stroke survivors hope that it's not too late to practice and gain skills. You've heard a little bit about Dr. Quack's work as well today. I just want to highlight her work on in Parkinson's disease, which is another really important research topic in terms of treatment. 
the mainline treatment for Parkinson's disease are dopaminergic medications. They're really good. They're really effective in treating some of the core symptoms of Parkinson's, which involve mainly a loss of motor movements. So movements become more rigid. Um, there's also a host of other motor symptoms, tremor, et cetera. The dopaminergic drugs are great. They sometimes, however, paradoxically cause motor <laughs> symptoms. And so her, her line of work broadly is getting at what, what and why is going on there. And she's demonstrated some new significant findings that Parkinson's disease patients on dopam dopaminergic medications have impairments in motor learning. So it's another um, type of side effect in which we, folks were not aware and will be very useful in helping plan treatment in the future, particularly because her work is identifying genetic risk factors. So certain patients may be particularly at risk for adverse side effects for the, the dopaminergic medications. Katie Dixon Gordon is a new faculty member in the clinical science program, and she is using a variety of research tools to study emotion dysregulation, suicidality, and other features of borderline personality disorder. The work I want to highlight here has revealed a very interesting um, finding that has immense treatment implications. Borderline personality disorder has always been theorized to be linked with increased stress reactivity and difficulties in modulating that reactivity in such an extreme manner that it does lead to very uh, devastating behavior such as self-harm and suicidality. However, in the research, has that, researchers have had a hard time finding a, a close link between borderline personality disorder and stress reactivity. And what she's found is that presence of post-traumatic stress symptoms will moderate this link. Post-traumatic stress is high, rates are high in borderline personality disorder. And so, so knowing this information has immediately clinic, immediate clinical significance. If you're a, um, planning treatment, you'll want to know the comorbidities in terms of how you may interact with and, and target symptoms in that patient. Uh, Dr. Dixon, Gordon, and I are collaborating and work with older adults with mild cognitive impairment and mild Alzheimer's disease. And this has been um, a, a nice collaboration I've had with, with the medical school in, in recruiting patients for this project. And we have been studying how normal changes with aging as well as abnormal changes in neurodegenerative disease may impact emotion regulation. How does how do change in memory and executive dysfunction? Um, how, how might those be mechanisms that underlie neuropsychiatric symptoms that are really common in, in mild cognitive impairment and Alzheimer's disease? So to summarize um, Jerry and my presentations, we are an incredibly diverse group and we are issues uh, we address issues relevant to brain dysfunction and disease across the lifespan from molecules to complex behavioral systems, and we're studying mechanisms that have clear translational significance. We're using some cutting edge neuroscience methods and techniques, targeting funding priorities at NH and NSF, and we have many examples of productive faculty collaborations. So we review this diversity and these collaborations as a strength, but we're really interested in further harnessing our diversity into defined themes raising the profile of our community, and helping us access our untapped capacity. We'd love to know how we can be better organized. How do we build connections amongst our labs here at UMass? How do we build more connections with the medical school? For example, how do we gain better access collaboratively to patient populations that we're, we're interested in studying? So thank you, and we'll take questions. <laughs>